Hello. I'm looking forward now to be spending the next four sessions with you to be discussing the history and the contemporary situation of American Jewry and American Judaism. And uh, that's a very big subject. And certainly we won't be able to cover everything or even most of the, the history, certainly, and, and, and the complexities of today. But hopefully we will touch on some important topics in the past, some building blocks. It's a word I'm going to use a lot. And to think a little bit about the implications as we live today and as we move forward. And here I just want to uh, note, history, in my opinion, never repeats itself or never duplicates itself, but there are certainly trends and there are certainly backdrops that are useful. And the key from my perspective as a historian and as a commentator on contemporary Jewry as well, is to think about the same and the difference. First, to look at what comparisons can help us to see in terms of what is common to past, present, maybe looking a little bit towards possible futures, but then in a very, in a very uh, uh, sharp way, noting that which is distinct and that which is not um, available to us to understand this point. And of course, history is fickle. We are not prophets. We are just trying to get a sense to the degree that we can. So let's, let's go to um, our, our uh, uh, format of the, the class itself and, uh, and, and the, the whole lecture series itself, and let's take a look at what we're gonna do. We have four meetings. Our, uh, the, the name of the course officially, as you saw, is American Jewish Identities Before and After October 7th, Continuities, Innovations, and Disruptions, uh, really reflects what I just said. And um, in the four, four sections, we're gonna look like this. The first section, session today, it, which I called really at home in America, um, is building blocks, is the one where we're gonna be looking at how the Jews got to America. We're gonna be looking at um, some core characteristics. Um, and, 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 and then the second uh, meeting, we're going to be focusing on two issues, religion and family, which are related in other ways, they're not related. However, I will be focusing on the relationship between religious developments, religious ethos, religious ideas, and how they come to play in actually a very creative um, and organic kind of way in light of the uh, realities of American Jewish family life. The third lecture will focus on issues which are really very much um, um, uh, present for us uh, today, uh, certainly in the post-October 7th era, which is uh, Israel and anti-Semitism. Um, and, um, and putting them together really begs the big question. Are they related? How are they related? What do we do with that? I don't have all the answers. I don't have a lot of the answers, but I certainly think that there is what to talk about. And I think that those building blocks from the first two classes, hopefully, will give us some um, some, some uh, useful tools in which to address this, the, this, this very pressing and critical topic. And I want to add, yes, I am an academic historian, I am a scholar, but I am engaged. I care about these subjects deeply. I am tried to be, to take a distance, to have distance, to be, I don't like the word objective. I try to use, bring the facts. I try to bring sources. I try to bring studies. That's what I do. But nonetheless, these are subjects which mean a lot to me and I care very much about. This is not an ideological class, but I admit to my own uh, existential uh, connection to this. Not only do I admit, I celebrate it. I'm very happy to be able to share and be in conversation with you. And that's exactly what we're gonna do in that last class, that last class, which is not taped, which is actually gonna be a live class, is actually gonna take place after I will have been in America just during the week of the uh, November uh, presidential elections uh, between um, uh, Donald Trump and, and Kamala Harris, and Vice President Kamala Harris. and. Um, that will be a very different type of session in the, in the sense that it'll be interactive and it'll be impressionistic to a certain degree and maybe looking forward. At the same time, I hope at that point 
if we have uh, been together already for three classes, that we will be able to um, bring to the table once again um, uh, the knowledge and the insight and the thought processes and the sort of conceptualization that I've tried to build throughout the first, um, the first couple of, uh, of meetings. Okay, so let's, let's um, move to um, the, 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 the first class at home in America and um, a lot to do, and let's hopefully we can do it in a productive manner. Okay, you know, actually I wanna, wanna say a few more things uh, with this screen before we look at numbers, because numbers are, um, are kind of dizzying, and I wanna look at them briefly. I'm not a big numbers person, but here and there we have to use them. So, um, okay, so the first thing I want to say is that the major questions that I want to, the, the major issues that I want to be discussing throughout the series, and we'll already get into them now, is uniqueness. What makes American Jewry unique? Everything in the world is unique, but what are the characteristics which we can point to? And I think there are some, and I, I, I referred um, a, a synonym or an uh, alternative title for this series, um, and specifically this class is from survival to Americanization to exceptionalism. And that word exceptionalism is gonna come up a lot. It's a very controversial word. word. And um, I will um, um, certainly be uh, uh, expanding upon it, but I think it's a word that's provocative in a very useful way historically, but uh, specifically today as well. So the questions, okay? And I like to be very Socratic about this. The questions that we will be asking today are three. What are the major immigration waves of Jews that came to the United States? How did Jews get to the United States? Um, what characteristics distinguish each one? Each of those innovation, immigration waves has a different character. Of course, it, they're diverse and not everyone's the same, but maybe we could talk, I think we can talk about certain uh, traits that are specific to each wave of immigration. And the third question is, is there a shared principle that connects them? And this is not Sherlock Holmes, so I'm gonna give it away right now. I think the Americanization issue is critical. It's not just an issue of adjusting, it's not just an issue of finding a, uh, a, a livelihood, it's not just an issue of having a place to live, but it's an issue of becoming part of the fabric of American society and American culture. Um, it is not, America is not the only place where this happens. In certain ways, this is something that's characteristic of modern Jewry, certainly in emancipated areas, but in, in, in a way, America um, um, is the one where it, it, it comes to fruition in the most um, um, uh, broad um, uh, uh, manner, but we'll, or more, most developed manner. We'll get to that uh, soon enough. So these are our first, those are our questions. How did they get here? What are their characteristics? And uh, what do they share? And then, um, I, as I said, I'm gonna make the argument that this Americanization, which sort of segues into exceptionalism um, in, 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 in an interesting way, are things that really connect groups that on paper or statistically or um, in terms of their place of origin, certainly, they um, would seem to be different from each other. Now, let's go to the slide of the, of the, um, of the numbers, excuse me. Um, and it's a little dizzying. So um, uh, if you look at American Jewry in 1790, this is already 15, 14 years after the, uh, uh, the Declaration of Independence, after America uh, becomes uh, an independent country from uh, not a colony of, of Britain anymore. Prior to that, it was a colony of the, the Dutch, New Amsterdam, New York, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll get back to that in a second. There are only 1,500 Jews, you see that, that first stat, living in the United States in 1790. That is, the Jews came to America in 1654. So we're talking about nearly 250, 240 years um, after um, Jews uh, landed in America, those 26 Jews who 
uh, who fled um, uh, Europe, Spanish Portuguese Jews who originally went to uh, Recife in Brazil. And after the Inquisition came to South America, they were given the opportunity to leave. And then some of them, many of those, the Jews of Recife went back to Europe. However, the original boat with 26 Jews from, from uh, Spanish Portuguese Jews came via South America to New Amsterdam, a Dutch colony. And uh, uh, a, a, about a little more than a decade later, that Dutch colony became an English colony and became known as New York. Always New, the city from Europe. Okay, and that in itself tells you a lot about the peripheral nature of America at that time. It is, these are colonies, these are extensions, these are appendages of the central European culture, where it is the central of certainly of Western culture at, at, at that time and for many years to come. But let's, oh, okay, so now that's that, that first immigration, and um, you can look at the numbers, you really see it. It starts in 1654, and basically it goes until 1840s, 50s. We usually refer to that as the Spartac immigration. There are plenty of Ashkenazim, excuse me, Spartan meaning Jews from uh, Southern Europe, primarily from Spain and then Portugal, but by then they had also spread throughout Western Europe. Um, these are not Jews, for the most part, who came from Arab lands. That was much later. Um, those were the people who initially made up that community, and they set the characteristics for that community or the, the framing of that community. Certainly by 1825, this is significant uh, Ashkenazi community, for example, East, a European community in uh, New York, for example, or in uh, South Carolina, but we'll get to that in a minute. So that, set, that first stage one of the immigrations basically goes till 1840, 50. 1840s, 50s, the best way to remember this is people who like American football, think of the San Francisco 49ers. The San Francisco 49ers are a football team that is named after the year 1849 when there was the gold rush to, uh, to the, the West Coast. And thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people came to America looking for gold. Some of them found gold. Some of them, like a Jew named Levi Strauss, realized that the people digging for gold needed something to wear. They made blue jeans. Um, 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 and, uh, and others made uh, railroad tracks, all sorts of things. But uh, that number, that big jump that you see to 50,000 and then 150,000, 170,000, uh, excuse me, uh, 200,000, 250,000, going into 18, 1870s, 1880s, so certainly until 1870, that's that second stage we often refer to that as the German uh, uh, speaking um, um, stage. So we have the Spartac stage, we have the German speaking stage. Um, uh, again, we'll get back to each one of these and talk more about their characteristics. Right now, we're just looking at the stages. Um, the third stage, which is the uh, most significant one in terms of how America transforms from a peripheral ex a a appendage to a uh, central uh, 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 um, uh, uh, a Jewish settlement, so to speak, is from the 1870s, 80s till about 1930. And look at that jump. From 250,000 Jews living in America in 18, 1880, a significant amount, even by, by, certainly by today's standards, there aren't that many uh, uh, Jewish communities in the world without many Jews. But nonetheless, um, when you compare that, that by 1930, there are 4 million, 200, about 250,000, so 4 million Jews have been added to America during that great immigration, um, mostly from Eastern Europe, not only from Eastern Europe, but certainly the Eastern Europeans were the dominant, and this is where most of the critical, what we call establishment institutions of America um, came, into, came into being at that time. Lots to talk about, about that immigration, and we will certainly uh, get back to it. Just to throw out one statistic, 1939, September 1st, 1939, the, uh, they have the Blitzkrieg in, 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 Pol in uh, German, Germany, Poland. Uh, tragically, the, the, the Germans uh, attack Poland. 
um, um, with the Russians from the other side in that time in a treaty with, with the Germans. And um, they eventually get to Warsaw, and Warsaw, the biggest Jewish uh, population uh, in, 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 in Europe, in terms of uh, uh, large cities, there are 350,000 Jews living there at that point. On September 1st, 1939, there are already 1 million, 1 million Jews living in New York City. Okay, so now we get to the Holocaust period and the post-Holocaust period from the 1930s through, let's say, 1960, and we see in that period another million significant amount of Jews come from four, three, essentially, to five, three by 1960. And this is a, a, a critical, that fourth stage um, of, of Jews, many of them who didn't really want to leave Europe, but were refugees, they had to, lots of refugees before, after, for different reasons, but certainly those who left around the Holocaust um, were, were fleeing um, uh, uh, life and death situations, many of them. Some of them came as late as the 19, late 1950s, 1956, when uh, there was the Hungarian Revolution. A lot of the Hungarian Hasidic Jews uh, uh, came at that time, Hungarian non-Hasidic as well. But as we will see, that, that fourth immigration changed a lot of things and continues to increase in its impact on American Jewry population-wise, culturally, politically, in, 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 in so many ways. And, and, and to, to a great extent today, the, the main, it's not the only, but the main interface or uh, sort of um, friction or, or, or conversation, however you want to describe it, is really between the great immigration from the 1880s, 1870s, 80s, till about the 19, late 1920s, 24 or 30, and that fourth immigration. The fifth immigration is a really interesting one, and it might have started before 1960, maybe started in the 1950s, around the time of the Tsena, when there was terrible, uh, there was terrible economic situation in the nascent state of Israel, uh, but it sort of keeps going. Um, that's that's a, an immigration that um, adds people, but there is also other reasons why uh, the American Jewish population really doesn't get that much higher, um, that immigration is dominated by people um, um, who are Israelis and Jews who come from Arab lands, um, the, the, the significant Persian population, uh, which has uh, come after, since uh, the revolution of 1989 uh, against the Shah, um, the, uh, from Iran, uh, uh, Jews from Syria, some of them who came earlier, but certainly they came in greater numbers later, and they've had a significant effect on uh, uh, the Brooklyn community, Deal, New Jersey, and, and, and some other areas. Um, this is a very interesting group, um, and we'll talk a little bit about them, and, and they're very different. Um, some of them are uh, have their own kind of enclaves. Other ones are just sort of unaffiliated, um, uh, but, but they're important and really not enough attention is paid to them and hopefully we'll at least touch on them a little bit. Uh, a, a lot, uh, 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 quite a lot of them come from uh, Sephardic, uh, North African uh, backgrounds and, have, uh, and really don't feel comfortable in the uh, predominantly Ashkenazic world of, of, that was established by the Eastern Europeans um, prior. And that, that is really important. Okay, so again, just to make sure we, we, if we just do it topically, we have, uh, we, if we do it by, by piece, we have five stages, Sephardic, German speaking, uh, the mass immigration, Eastern Europe, the, the around uh, pre post Holocaust uh, refugee uh, uh, stage, number four. And number five, we have the Israeli uh, Mizrahi Sephardi uh, uh, immigration uh, since, and then obviously individuals uh, always going back and forth. Okay, so now. Let's, let's start looking more specifically at each one of these. Um, I think I'm pretty good on time right now. I'm very conscious of it. I have a little timer up there. So that's very useful to me. I should get one of those in my class in Bar Ilan University. I think that would be a really good thing for me. Okay, so we're gonna go to um, this next slide. Excuse me. Okay. So this is, um, I, you know, like I said, we have to be topical. We can't cover everything. The Jews of, um, you know, maybe I'll just go for a second. 
um, all the way to the end, and we'll look at the map. Um, this map uh, is a map without names of states, but um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a contemporary map uh, from 2015. Um, but just, uh, just so we get a sense of the United States, uh, the, 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 to my right is the East Coast, to my left is the West Coast. Um, Jews uh, came to the East Coast, that the Northeast, and then along the seaboard, those were the British 13 colonies with which America was established. That sort of triangle one that's dark green, of course, is New York. The bottom is Florida, which was not part of the colonies originally. To the left, you have California, those, and uh, Illinois, Chicago in the middle, which is pretty dark. Those are the largest, uh, New York, New Jersey, right below it. Um, those are the largest concentrations of Jews today. Initially, the concentrations were actually, they weren't so big, we saw the numbers, but they were along the, the seaboard. The Sephardic Jews were mercantile Jews. They were involved in trade, in a lot of types of trade, some of that trade very complicated, some of them, some of that very crucial to the development of the United States. And um, they lived along the eastern seaboard um, in places like New York, Philadelphia, uh, of, of, of parts of Maryland, uh, moving down into Virginia, moving down into uh, um, the Carolinas, Georgia, uh, et cetera. Um, so, um, we're going to be focusing initially now on that eastern seaboard, and then we'll sort of move. I'm not going to go back to the map each time, but the Jews move westward. I don't know if my hand is going in the right direction, but the Jews move westward, and the itinerant pre, uh, uh, peddlers move to the south, and they move westward. And then that gold rush, 1849, of course, takes them all the way to California, um, and, um, and then they start to have their places, and then the, the, late 19, the, the late 20th century saw the move of more Jews to the, what's called the Sun Belt, to California again, to uh, Nevada, uh, uh, Las Vegas, to uh, Florida, to uh, parts of Texas, etc. So this map, it, it, it gives you percentages of Jews of each state. We're not going to be focusing on that, but just to give you a uh, spatial ge geography, of course, above America is Canada, which is a significant place for Jews as well, for certainly some of its main centers, and below uh, we have Mexico, Central America, uh, which also has significant Jewish populations, Alaska, which is on the bottom, 0.8%. I do know some Jews from Alaska. Um, and of course, Chabad has reached Alaska and it's very significant there, but um, pretty small community in Anchorage and maybe one or two other places. Okay, so I, I gave this as an example. I've actually spent a sabbatical in Charleston. It's a beautiful city, highly recommended. Charleston, Jews who came there, who established this, this, this uh, synagogue. This one was built in, in 1749, but there were Jews living there. Uh, um, a little beforehand, Kal Kadosh, classic Sephardic name. These were uh, uh, merchants. Um, they created a kihila. They had uh, a, a, a community that was modeled on the community that had been established in New Amsterdam, New York beforehand, um, in, called Sheri Israel. They saw themselves as being sort of uh, the Sephardic nation, that they had survived the uh, forced conversions and they had survived uh, uh, the uh, inquisitions uh, against Jews who had forcibly converted, who maintained some sort of Jewish identity in Europe, and they had made it to the new uh, colonies um, and the eventually the new country where they could have religious freedom, which they really, really appreciated. These were homogeneous communities for the most part, initially Jews who came from uh, Sephardic backgrounds. They, uh, there was only one community in each city, just like classically you have in, in pre-modern and early modern uh, Europe as well. Uh, uh, a, a, a lot of them spoke uh, languages besides English, Sephardic types of dialects. Um, they didn't have rabbis. Uh, they, uh, they weren't particularly observant. And uh, um, um, this is actually a little bit later, but in Charleston, when I was there, I went to the, 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 the old cemetery there. And it's fascinating. There's, there's a Jew, I believe, was, his name is Levy, who, was, who fought in the Confederate 
uh, Southern army during the, uh, uh, the Civil War in the 1860s in America, and he was married to a non-Jew, and uh, they had a rule that you couldn't marry non-Jew, you couldn't, excuse me, certainly couldn't marry them, but he didn't mind that one, but you couldn't bury them in the communal, in the Kahal Cemetery. Kahal Kadosh, right? It means the, the community. It's not a synagogue. It's just a, a one manifestation of a broader community where all the services come out of one place. This is a, a model which was which, which American Jews departed from pretty soon in the 18th century. But the model is you, all the services are, are provided by the Kahal Kadosh, the kosher food, the matzah, whatever halachic uh, uh, um, issues that come up, marriages, divorces, um, even without rabbis in consultation with European Jews and, uh, or authorities. Um, and certainly burial, um, uh, milah, circumcision, burial. Anyway, Levi wanted to be buried next to his non-Jewish wife. So actually, you can see till today, there's actually like a, a, a spot at the end, uh, the right corner of the Charleston Cemetery where Levi's buried, and his wife's buried outside the cemetery right next to him. So I, I think that's a really good illustration. Uh, I wish I had a picture of it to show you of of, of the sense of being part of the call, but in the end, you know, there aren't, how many people are there? How many opportunities are there for, social, for socializing, for marrying, uh, uh, and uh, sometimes areas where mostly men, and there is plenty of intermarriage at that period in the United States. We're gonna be talking more about intermarriage uh, next week, but it's certainly something which exists a, a, as, as part of American life for many, many years, and in, in a way actually declined and then has certainly uh, jumped tremendously in the last um, uh, 50, 60 years. Okay, so that, that community uh, was very traditional, but had a, a heterogeneity to it. Um, and um, there were people who very, did very well as merchants, people who, uh, uh, um, who, who became uh, part of, 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 of American society in significant ways, were involved in the American Revolution. One named Chaim Solomon comes up, there are others, uh, uh, many names that we could bring here. Um, but um, that, by, by the 1820s, more and more Ashkenazim are starting to come. And one, uh, 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 one example of that is uh, that in New York, by the 1820s, a second synagogue asked permission to establish itself, B.J. B'nai Yishurun, which exists till, tena till today on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And essentially, that's a big moment um, when uh, Ashkenaz would say, we don't want to be really so much part of the Kahal anymore. We want to be an independent synagogue with our right, our ritual. And, and that that, that moment in 1825, uh, uh, about 75 years after uh, Beit Elohim was started in, um, uh, in, in Charleston, really uh, uh, shows the, the, the move away. A second thing, though, that relates specifically to Charleston is that uh, as Ashkenazim come, um, including someone named Poznansky, um, and uh, as the Sephardim become more Americanized and see how their children are sort of attracted to the American culture and the way, even the way a religion is done in America, um, reform starts to seep in. And um, we could see this visually very nicely um, when uh, uh, Kahal Kadosh, um, um, Kahal Kadosh uh, builds its new synagogue in the 19th century. Let's take a look at it. That is uh, the present one, which is the one that exists in the 19th century. That is Kahal Kadosh Beit Elohim today, KKBE, which is the earliest reform synagogue in America, which has its roots in that Sephardic community. But that, uh, as I described, Ashkenazim come in and, the, and cultural influences, etc. cetera. And, and, and look at that edifice, which has a neoclassical uh, columns, etc. And look how similar it is to a neighboring city. Uh, this is a, a, a well-known church in Savannah, Georgia, another town that had a very significant Jewish community, which has a very beautiful synagogue as well. But really, just go back for a second and just look at, this is the culture. You see what is beauty, what is uh, a, a, a holy edifice, edifice etc. Let's now move from the Svardim uh, to the German second stage. Um, and here we go. Um, and uh, uh, act actually, essentially, 
uh, in terms of the German second stage. I've said some stuff about them. Um, uh, the Germans were, uh, maybe this is a good place to put it in this slide actually, the Germans who came to America in the uh, second half, uh, mid to second half of the 19th century uh, were of all types. Some were, were from, uh, from towns, but many were from cities, and they were people who had already uh, gone through emancipation, Jews who spoke German, Jews, some of them who were quite acculturated, exposed already to early reform in uh, uh, Europe, as we said, and, um, um, and uh, they were the people who founded the reform movement in America. Uh, they were the people who, some of them became major industrialists and major figures in Wall Street, banking, uh, 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 many, many areas, and they established some very important uh, uh, Jewish organizations as well. Um, so, um, and, and, and they were sort of, certainly in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they were the aristocrats. The Spartans sort of dissipated. They sort of became, they were so small that they had very little impact. And you have these famous synagogues in New York, in Charleston, in, uh, in uh, Turo, Turo Synagogue, in, in Newport, et cetera, Savannah. But for the most part, these communities either transformed to Ashkenazi communities or kind of uh, uh, lost their impact. The Germans impacted a lot, specifically on the, on the economic history of the Jews, specifically on the charitable history of the Jews, speci uh, specifically on the uh, rise of Reform Judaism. and. In terms of their, for the, a lot of them being uh, anti-Zionist in the initial areas, that's also an important area. That is that second stage. I want to move quickly now, looking at our time, to our major four million Jews in the area of about 50 years who come to uh, who come to uh, who come to um, America. And here I just took one slide. Um, from a, a, a lovely movie that Steven Spielberg pro uh, produced, an animated movie called uh, uh, American, The American Tales, uh, not Tale Tales, uh, about Fievel Mouskowitz, a little ma mouse from Eastern Europe, um, whose family runs away from the pogroms and goes to America. Now, it's, a, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's Hollywood and, uh, um, and uh, some, in a certain degree, to a certain degree, it idealizes the American dream and, uh, and Americanization and culturization and, and, and Spielberg, Spielberg's view of his family's acculturation success. Um, but there's this lovely, lovely um, song that they sing. There's no cats in America, say these mouse, mice. Cats mean anti-Semites, they mean pogromists, they mean Cossacks, they mean people who chase and kill Jews, and the streets are paved with cheese, because that's what, that's what mice like, they like cheese, cheese is gold. Of course, it was a, a paraphrase or it was a, a play on the streets are paved with gold. The Goldena Medina, the, 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 the country where Jews would succeed financially, where Jews would have all opportunities, and much of that is true. Of course, there were cats in America. We'll talk about that more um, in, 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 in two sessions. There were certainly cats in America. They were always there. But maybe the cats were a little bit different than the cats in, uh, in Eastern Europe and in, part, and in Central Europe. And maybe those cats didn't have as long a, a history, a family history of Jew hatred. Um, and maybe the church didn't have the same roles that it did in Europe. So there were cats, but maybe the cats were a little bit less violent or a little bit less populous or a little bit less of a consensus they were in America. So there were cats in America. There was cheese in America. There were also lots of challenges um, and I, without going into all the details, I'm certainly raising that, and we'll get back to some of those challenges later. And here, the challenges, of course, start at Ellis Island um, in, uh, 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 off uh, Lower Manhattan uh, in New York, where most of the boats arrived um, uh, from the early uh, 20th century. Uh, my grandparents arrived from uh, Galicia to Ellis Island, and you see uh, Jews um, uh, arriving there, and now we're going to be talking about that third stage. And um, here, what I want to say about this third stage is, one, people who came from America for, to America for the first part came because they saw opportunity, economic opportunity, political freedom, 
they, some of them were worried about their religious identity, they were worried about uh, 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 assimilating or, or being swallowed in by uh, American culture, but most of them weren't that worried about it. Some of them had strong political views. There were strong communists, socialists who came from Eastern Europe. There were other types of political activists. There were Zionists. David Ben-Gurion lived in America for a while and so did some other leading early Zionists. But for the most part, it was refugees who were fleeing state-sponsored anti-Semitism, fleeing the limitations of uh, of, of Eastern European life. And there are all sorts of tales. This, this particular Jew here, he has uh, a, a beard, but there are tales of Jews shaving their beards on the boats as they saw the Statue of Liberty in front of them. There are, there are, there are stories about women who had scheitlach, who had wigs that they threw overboard, and men who threw their tefillin bags. And if you dug, if you actually do, dove, scuba dove into the to, into the Hudson River or the East River, you might be able to find some of them once upon a time. These are tales, no one's ever done it. But the point being, there's this sense that we leave Europe, we're in the, the new land, in the new land, the, the, the things that we did, the cause of socialization, um, because that was the norm if you lived in a small Jewish uh, uh, city, although there was plenty of, uh, of, uh, of assimilation and, and certainly uh, modernization um, and acculturation in, in large cities in, in, in Eastern Europe. Um, but uh, so some people had already by the late 19th century, early 20th century, gone through a process and adopted new political ideologies, as I mentioned. But even Jews who were basically traditional in Eastern Europe, because that's how you did things, many of them very quickly uh, 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 abandoned those things on, on the boats, or certainly when the economic situation was such that keeping the Sabbath was virtually, it was very difficult, it wasn't impossible, but we have all these stories about Jews who were fired every Friday when they wouldn't uh, refuse to come to work the next day, uh, or, 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 or Monday morning when they arrived, um, uh, and most people weren't able to manage that situation. Some of them um, sort of tried to balance um, um, a lot of the families like that, and some of those were the sort of anchors of, of, of early orthodoxy in America, but for the most part, people sort of um, moved to a style that would work in the American realities. Um, so here we have the, what we call the first settlement of the Jews. This is uh, uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan, early 20th century. You see the tenements, you see all the stores, you see the, the peddlers, you see, uh, uh, if, if you um, 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 call it sleep, is, is, is a, Henry Roth is a great book that describes this, a uh, book that I, I think is a, just a fantastic novel. Um, if you want to look at the next settlement, you click at Alfred Kazin's A Walker in the City, and there are just lots of immigrant novels, I'm just mentioning two, um, and second, second gen novels that are, are really powerful and describe the, that moment, but I think Call It Sleep is really the classic. Um, and, it, um, um, and, 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 and this sort of view of, of refugees coming, uh, they, had, they, they were able to come. My family uh, uh, started in Eldred Street on my mother's side. This is very personal. Um, there's still Jewish life in the Lower East Side, it actually is a resurgence, but in the early 20th century, this was, this was the, the core. And here we see how people were Yiddish speakers, people, um, uh, the, 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 the stores wanted to make sure people would know what they, what they were selling, so the signs were in English and in uh, a, a Yiddish, um, um, and um, many people were involved in, in the clothing industry as well already then. Um, but uh, this, this uh, sort of, um, this cosmopolitan, sort of world of, 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 uh, of, of Lower East Side, and there were concentrations of Jews, of refugees in, in, in many other cities as Jews spread out, um, was a place that had a tremendous ferment culturally. Synagogues, uh, 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 communist parties, Landsmannschaften for the different uh, uh, societies for different towns, burial societies, Yiddish theater, uh, 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 um, Talmud Torahs for teaching uh, kids uh, uh, their traditions. It's, the, it's, it's a time when there are important institutions which, which arise, such as the fledgling Yeshiva University, Yeshivat 
Yeshivas Eitz Chaim and Rabbi Yitzchak Al Khanan um, will talk about the conservative and reform um, institutions, which start a little bit earlier, um, 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 or in the 1870s, 80s, 80s um, uh, in the next uh, session. Um, but um, uh, I think it's really important to realize that these Jews wanted to make it. They wanted to become Americans. They wanted to learn the language. They wanted their children to be successful. They wanted their children to get public school, public school educations. They wanted them to be able to take advantage of the political, uh, relative political security that they had. Um, and, um, and they really wanted to become Americans. They wanted to detach from Europe. And um, um, there are stories which are actually sort of tragic about families, lots of families, and maybe some of you can relate to this, who would talk about how families didn't like to talk about what happened in Europe. They, you know, sort of, there wasn't that reminiscence or a sense like, life started when we got off the boat. I know in my family, which is a family that didn't discard its tradition, but nonetheless, the story that I remember from my youth was my grandmother talking me, talking to me about as a three-year-old, getting lost on the steerage, on the boat that was taking her family to, from Galicia to Hamburg and via Hamburg to, uh, to lower Manhattan where her family settled. And the story wasn't about Galicia. I only learned about Galicia when I went there and I asked her about uh, her family's origins, but it wasn't something that was really talked about very much, at least in my family. So now um, let's get, we're, we're going a little bit over time, but we'll be okay. We'll try to stick pretty well. Um, let's get to that fourth stage. And the fourth stage, if we talk about the third stage being looking towards the golden Medina, a lot of the Jews, not all of them, but a lot of the Jews who came during around the Holocaust, who, who, who escaped uh, Germany, but mostly Eastern Europe in the late 1930s, and then throughout the 1940s and after 45, it was very difficult to get in America. There were, there were extreme uh, limitations, and that's also part of why that major third stage ended sometime in the 1920s, because then there became a, a, a limitation uh, uh, on uh, immigration, not just of Jews, but of Europeans in general in America in the 1920s. But the refugees who did arrive and eventually arrived in Moss and reached uh, another million Jews, a lot of them didn't leave Europe despite the economic uh, opportunities because it was a trefa Medina. It was a non-kosher place. It was a place where, where, where Jews were gonna lose their faith, lose their loyalty, lose their traditions, lose their family connections, and were gonna be swallowed up by the economic and cultural opportunities that America uh, uh, had. And therefore, uh, there were Jews actually who came from Eastern Europe who went back because they, they got afraid. But, uh, but uh, after the Holocaust, around the time of the Holocaust, there was no choice. So we have uh, Rosh Yeshiva, we have Yeshiva heads, we have Hasidic uh, 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 court leaders or the remnants people who were survivors, people whose families, whose institutions had been destroyed, who, who there was nothing left for them in Europe. Some of them went to Israel, and there's lots of parallels between how Israel develops in the 1940s, 50s, um, 60s, and in America in interesting ways. Um, and some of them came to the United States. Um, and um, these people didn't look at America as an ideal, but they also recognized the opportunity. This is an important nuance point. We have a person like Rav Aaron Cutler. Rav Aaron Cutler, um, who was already a major yeshiva head in Klatsk and Slatsk in, 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 in Lithuania and then in Poland, he comes to uh, America in uh, 1941, and, uh, 41, 42, and he uh, quickly uh, establishes a yeshiva called the Beth Madrash Gadol, the large uh, a study hall, um, which he, uh, as soon as he can, he moves it to Lakewood, New Jersey, a chicken farming town, uh, about an hour, an hour and a half from, from, the United, from New York, the, the concentrated Jewish life of New York. He wants to create a yeshiva that is an enclave that is separate from the Jews who have arrived because he thinks the Jews who have arrived, even the ones who are still keeping the Sabbath, are treif, 
are not kosher enough, are going to pollute his, the, 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 the pure souls that he wants to cultivate. And he starts his yeshiva in, 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 um, in Lakewood with, with a few students. By the time he died in 1962, and his son Schneer Cutler took over, there are about 250 students there. Um, today, there are about 7,000 full-time, primarily married fellows, Kolel fellows studying there um, for many, many years, some of them, on average seven years. And Lakewood in the last 10 years, 15 years, has really exploded as a new Jewish metropolis and as sort of a a Haredi, an uh, ultra-Orthodox city um, uh, that actually rivals New York and Brooklyn in many ways and has its own institutions, etc. cetera. Um, his, his grandson, named after Aaron Cutler, is a really, really enterprising person. And, and, is, and, 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 and what's so interesting about here is that you could look at these people as anti-American, anti-culture, anti-establishment, uh, but in their own ways, they very much understood that America was a place of opportunity. They even might have understood what their Hasidic uh, rivals or brethren like Satmer, who eventually, the Satmer Hasidim from Hungary, uh, Romania, eventually set up a city in, in, in northern New York in the Muncie area, Rockland County. It's called Kiryas Yoel. It's named after their, their founder in America, Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, and, and my, my uh, uh, dear friend and colleague David Myers and his wife Nomi Stolzenberg wrote a wonderful book about this city as, a, as an enclosed Hasidic city in America. And you say, what's a Hasidic city doing in America? And what's the state of Utah, Mormon state doing in America? And what are all these enclaves of Amish in Pennsylvania and, 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 and of all, all sorts of other groups? There is a tradition in America of religious freedom which allows for uh, 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 groups uh, the, the, the Quakers who came to Pennsylvania, the, 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 the Puritans who came to Massachusetts, and that has uh, sustained itself even as parts of America have become very pluralistic. So um, these institutions, the, uh, the uh, Lithuanian yeshivish ones like Lakewood, like Tells in Cleveland, like uh, the Nary Israel in Baltimore, like the Mary Yeshiva in Brooklyn, um, these are places which have furnished intellectual power, and at the same time we have Hasidic courts like Satmar, like Chabad Lubavitch, like Babov in Borough Park, that have um, tremendous birth rates, they have uh, 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 people who have accumulated wealth, though there's a lot of poverty as well, and they are influencing American Jewish life in significant ways, not just in the Orthodox community, politically, um, in terms of uh, their, their, their uh, uh, impact um, on, on lots of different things. Um, and um, we certainly need to go further into that. And I'll just briefly say something of, about the, um, uh, the, this fifth one. And this is really an interesting phenomenon in the last 10 years. Israel American Council, is something that was started um, with uh, the funding of the Edelson family from Las Vegas. But what it is, is basically all these Israelis who don't feel connected, who came in that fifth immigration, don't feel connected to the establishment, not to the synagogues, not to the Jewish community centers, not to the federations. They realize that these people feel very connected to Israel. Like the Orthodox, they're pretty right wing politically. And um, they've created an, an organization which is sort of creating an Israeli-American identity. Um, as, and, and, and some of their children go to Israeli army through the Garin Sabar uh, programs. They have uh, youth movements there. But this is a really interesting ph phenomenon which is significant in terms of seeing the, 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 the maturation of the, this fifth immigration in places like Boca Raton, Hollywood, Florida, in place like Los Angeles, um, 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 uh, Great Neck in New York, et cetera. <clears throat> and um, I think that that IAC is really a really a, a, a good uh, framing for that. Um, um, there is a lot more to say about that, and I, and I feel badly that in terms of both time and in terms of the nature of this course that I can't say more, but I really want to flag this for people who are trying to understand the trajectory of American Jewry uh, from a, a economic, power, cultural, a connection to Israel perspective, 
Um, and from all these perspectives, this group in particular, but others as well that I have put under that uh, uh, category of the fifth uh, uh, immigration, I think are extraordinarily significant. Um, now, I'd like to um, sort of end with this idea of, of, of an exceptionalism. Um, we we'll just have a few more minutes. Um, the Jews didn't make up the idea that America is different. This is an article um, from the 1950s by Ben Halpern. He was a professor in, 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 in Brandeis. He's actually a very big American Zionist. Doesn't mean he wanted to move to Israel, but he was a big supporter of Israel. Uh, very important intellectual. And, um, and America, uh, from the get-go, says we're different. We're different politically. We have freedom of, of religion, freedom of speech, uh, freedom certainly for men, maybe not so much for women, freedom for white men, not, not necessarily for uh, people of color, but in principle, the ideas of dem democracy, of freedom, et cetera, which were sort of um, uh, introduced to Europe after a long history before, were sort of part of the fabric of this country from the get-go as part of their detachment from Europe and Jews benefited it from it in, in many ways together with this sort of capitalist instinct of, of being able to, if you can prove yourself, you can make it. It's not totally true, of course. Again, there's always prejudice. There's always, always people who take things from the old world. There's religious influences. I don't want to uh, uh, underplay those impacts. They still exist till today. Nonetheless, there is the sense that America is a different place and the Jews ate it up Certainly after World War II in the 1950s, if we look on the bottom there, it's a little hard to see. Since the Second World War, and especially since Eisenhower elections, all America ha uh, has been overwhelmed with the feeling that this was our time of destiny, that the century was the American centuries. Uh, we had opened a new chapter, altering the whole character of everything that has gone before. The end of the second uh, column, the end of the Second World War saw the old world collapse. We, have a new, we had a new deal. The American way of life is triumphant. And within that, the Jews are so excited because this is the opportunity. All the discrimination, all the difficulties, all the sense of being an other, the otherness that was so part of the European Jewish experience and in, in, in its own way, the Sephardic experience or the, the, uh, uh, the Mizrahi experience in Muslim lands, America in principle, it, 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 it's, a, it's a clean slate. And, 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 and there's a sense that, that Halpern discusses of American exceptionalism. Exceptionalism means that we're not just different now, we're different forever. It is not an exile, it is, he says. Uh, we're all immigrants. Everyone came from somewhere. The non-Jews came from somewhere. The Italians, the, the Irish, the, 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 the Protestants who came before, the Puritans, the, the, all the different denominations, all the different sects of Christianity. We're all a hodgepodge. The, this also came together with this melting pot approach that we could all come together, which after a while sort of dissipated. But nonetheless, there is a strong sense and it plays into Jews' greatest hopes. And that word that we're gonna use next week regarding reform, that America is the promised land. It's not just the promised land now, a place of opportunity. Jews all throughout history move from place to place. It's the sense that this place, because of its foundations, because of its principles, because of the way it developed, is a place where Jews, the, 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 the sort of cycle of Jews arriving, success, discrimination, and eventually ostracization, uh, 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 being uh, uh, thrown out or certain, or even being slaughtered, all that does not work in America. And um, now I wanna be clear, and with this I'm really going to uh, uh, conclude today's uh, meeting, that scholars already in the you know, 1960s certainly began to attack this and to talk about there is anti-Semitism, all these things he talks about don't really work and we don't know and how can you be predictive and that, that is counterproductive. But I wanna argue that yes, there is a, a very strong literature in the scholarship till today of why America is not exceptional or why using the term exceptionalism is counterproductive or why, uh, but I, I wanna argue that it's, it's part of the 
of, of, of the Geist. It's part of the, the spirit of American Jewry. It's really ingrained that America and American Jewish life is different. And there are certainly differences, but how different and whether that sense of exceptionalism is useful, is helpful, enables American Jewry to dig deep into their creativity and to have tremendous confidence in their future and their ability to withstand various challenges. That's one side. The other side is whether it at times can be a stumbling block to recognition of historical changes and, 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 and difficulties that are, are hard to imagine when you're so sure that this is an exceptional place. This is a question that I don't have an answer to, but I think it's a question we have to be asking historically, and we have to certainly be asking it today as uh, we move further into the 21st century and we are experiencing things that seem to be sui generis, seems to be new. We'll get to that as we move forward. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to our next session together.